Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and it's time for part two of the Q&A, so let's go ahead and knock this out. All right, first question. Bonjour, coach. I would like to know what you consider to be the best way to get back to a previous level of strength of uh, squat 165 kg, deadlift 225 kg. I like that deadlift. Following a setback, in my case, Sala Vanilla, which destroyed me in the space of a week, uh, I was previously following a periodized program, and the thought of running several five-week cycles of it just to get back to where it was is so frustrating. I've been doing linear progression for the two months plus since my illness, but I find uh, I run myself into the ground before I'm able to reach my previous strength levels. This mainly uh, concerns the squat and deadlift. My only other periodized looks like the overhead press is coming along fine. Merci beaucoup, coach. Sorry, I can't speak French. Was that Merci Buku? Is that how you say it? All right. I'm going to try. I tried at least, brother. I tried. So over to your point. Actually, that deadlift is good. I like that. That's a really strong deadlift for you. Um, here's what I'm going to say. Don't do the linear progression. That's the problem you ran into. Uh, you should have just gone back to your normal periodization because that's the thing you've noticed. Uh, your only periodized lift, the overhead press is coming along really well. Right, and I mean, any sort of food poisoning or salmonella or anything like that, yeah, you're going to lose a lot of progress in that week. Ease back into your normal training. Uh, go back to the exact periodized program that you originally ran. All right, when we get setbacks, go back into the flow of our normal training. You're going to have to spend a, a week or so going lighter, getting yourself uh, replenished and everything in terms of nutrition. But you, you need to, after an illness or something like that, go back into the training because it's not an injury that set you back, it's illness. You need to go back to your normal program. You shouldn't have really changed. And I mean, hindsight's always twenty twenty. Return to what you were doing. The exact program you used to build that 165 and 225, do that again. Don't try to use linear progression, right? Because you're not gonna be able to do linear progression. If you're, if you're outside of that level of advancement and it looks like you are, uh, it's not going to work. Go back to periodization. You'll be back in no time. All right, next question. Hey, Jason, what is your opinion on fat grips for arm size and strength? Do they really work or is it just another gimmick product? Vegan Gain says he started doing bicep work with fat grips and says that his arms grew half inch to two in, in, in two weeks. Opinion. Total bullshit. Um, I don't know what delusional stuff Richard pulled say, claiming that, other than maybe he ate a few D-bolt tabs every day. All right. Are fat grips a gimmick? No. It increases bar diameter. They're a valuable grip training tool. Fat grips. Is there anything about training with a fat grip that is going to recruit any more bicep or, or tricep activation? No. I mean, let's be honest here. If a muscle is going to grow, make sudden growth from something you're doing is because that something you're doing is causing more muscle fiber recruitment, right? There's nothing about a fat grip that is going to cause more stimulation of the bicep or tricep. Now, some people will argue, well, because you're gripping this way, it's using less forearm. It's like, not, not really. But even if it did, how is using less forearm going to cause more bicep or tricep muscle recruitment? Is it maybe because it's forcing you to grip it tighter in some ways? Maybe if it's forcing you to grip it tighter because you weren't gripping the, the bar tight before, then okay, but you might get a, a radiant effect from that because gripping a bar tighter always improves muscle fiber recruitment and strength. We know this. This is why you should never limp wrists or loosely grip any, any exercise ever. But there's nothing inherent in a fat grip that's going to do that. Furthermore, Muscles don't grow that fast, right? Someone who's already been lifting for six months is never going to gain a half inch of actual muscle size in two weeks in their arms. Even on steroids, you're not going to do that. You'll say, what? What do you mean? Yeah, you will. Well, yeah, you'll gain that in, in temporary gains. Maybe some extra water retention of the muscles because of transient storage factors. But when you come off the gear, that's going to go away, right? Absolutely ludicrous. Uh, I mean, what a charlatan. If he's honestly telling people that, uh, Richard is literally a bigger moron than I thought. 
He's actually stupid if he actually believes that. So he's either trolling being a con man or just legitimately stupid. There, there's no way that that's possible because there's nothing about a fat grip that's going to cause more bicep activation. I'm not against using them as a grip training tool or to break up your training monotony a little bit. That's fine. But they don't do anything special for your arms other than your forearms because they make it harder to grip a barbell. Requires you to improve your grip, which will make your forearms grow. That's it. All right, next question. Hey, Jason, you said your novice strength standards for a novice after one year in the gym uh, with certain criteria are partly based on trainees' logs online. How do you know what they did their list correctly, i.e. a trainee might do half rep or touch and go bench but still claim that he performed that weight? Wouldn't this skew your standards? Just curious. Also, keep up the great vids. Thanks, coach. Uh, that's a valid question. Now, there's a couple of ways I could look at that. Number one, I have met people in person at gyms who have run my program and then seen how they actually perform their lifts, right? You guys got to remember, I've trained at a dozen different gyms since putting that program out. Even though I've had home gyms twice, I've trained at a dozen different gyms. It's because the internet doesn't know where all I trained every time. It doesn't mean I haven't trained at different gyms. So I've seen people's results. Uh, also, some of the people in their training logs have uploaded video footage. I've run someone through this program early on, a personal close friend of mine. All right, so we have all of that. So how do we still tell? Well, you've got a point. Some people are going to cheat on that. You look at their ratios. In other words, you can't cheat the deadlift. Okay, they might hitch it. They might not lock the deadlift but they're still gonna be fairly close. It's hard to cheat the deadlift numbers. It really is. It's hard to cheat the overhead press number, unless you were just flat out doing a push press. So while we can bounce and touch and go and do bounces and ass off the bench on the bench to get a much higher number, yeah, that can happen. They could be doing a half squat. Yeah, they could do that and cheat those. What happens when you look at the other list? What happens when you compare their ratios? In other words, in other words, if the guy is deadlifting 315 for five and he's squatting 305 for five or 315 for five, we know he's half squatting, right? We can just look at that and tell. But if he's hitting a 405 deadlift around the time he's hitting a 315 squat, we could probably safely assume that squat is correct. Same thing on the bench. We can go over and look at those ratios, right? If the guy is hitting a 205 bench for five and he's still only able to standing press 105 pounds, we know he's bouncing that bar off his chest and lifting his ass 95% of the time. But what if he's repping 135 on the press for five? 140. Well, we know he's probably pretty close on the strength on the bench, right? When you start hitting 60% or more on the press compared to the bench, his bench is most likely relatively strict. And even if it isn't, he's probably strong enough to do it strict based upon his overhead press numbers. He's just not doing it. So you can look at the different ratios and get a good idea. So there is that to work with also to tell if they're actually cheating the log or not. That's why we don't look at just the squat and the bench. All right, next question and last question of the week. Hi, Jason. I know your stance on multivitamins, but would it be somewhat beneficial taking them during keto diet phase as the vitamins are lower due to the nature of the diet? Thanks. Um, Ketogenic diets aren't low in vitamins or minerals. That's, that's absolutely ludicrous. What, what, what are you calling a keto diet? Most of us eat vegetables. I eat green vegetables every single day on a keto diet. Now, are we pretending that steak and cheese aren't loaded with vitamins and minerals? I mean, let's, let's be realistic here. The average ketogenic diet is going to be more complete in terms of vitamins and minerals than even most well-planned out, say, vegan diets. Right? So what do you mean? Okay, let's say you eat only three things. Let's say that your keto diet consists of literally nothing but steak, cheese, and spinach. Right? 
Now, I wouldn't recommend you only do that, but just using that as an example, those are three popular keto foods. And you're hitting a fair number of calories on that. Like you're not doing some starvation diet. You're, you're eating 2,500 calories or more, which you should be eating as a lifter. Then what are you deficient in? Now, we could argue that certain lifters would benefit from things like magnesium and stuff like that. I, I take magnesium and D3, right? That's what I take. And creatine. Those are my three supplements. That is my entire supplement stack. Vitamin D3, magnesium, and creatine. We could argue that I don't need those for health. I take them just to ensure my performance and recovery and bone density and everything else. I just want to guarantee. And they're really cheap. But as far as a multivitamin goes, number one, we don't have real evidence that multivitamins work. We don't have real evidence that multivitamins are safe. And it's quite easy to hit all of your vitamins and minerals on a ketogenic diet. It's one of the easier diets to do it on. It, it shouldn't be a problem at all. I, I don't understand what makes you think that meat and vegetables don't have vitamins in them. Like, what delusional, goofy-ass vegans have you been listening to? The thing you've got to supplement the most on a keto diet is salts. Salts are the thing you're most likely to have problems with, sodium, magnesium, potassium, right? If you're going to supplement anything on a keto diet, salts, which is why I supplement magnesium. I eat, consume a magnesium salt every day. I dump extra sea salt. I use pink Himalayan sea salt in all my food. All right, I cook with it. All right, guys, but that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time.